Lesson 16 is our first of two lessons on measurement in our introductory 25 lessons, so we'll be introducing some new rules and definitions, and you should have looked at those already. And measurement is our sixth of ten major topics that are in Shorman Algebra 2. And this 1960 painting by Henry Hintermeister is of his idea of what a young George Washington looked like when he was a land surveyor. And George Washington, of course, he was the first president of the United States. But before that, he was very involved with measurement, with measuring land. And something important to understand here is that measuring anything requires precision and accuracy, not only by the people doing the measuring, but by the people who built the measuring device, the instrument in other words. So moving on, this lesson has four parts and the first part is on why standards matter and so this part A is mostly uh, listening and reading through this as opposed to an active note-taking component with lots of examples but it's important nonetheless to think about why standards matter and, and why we measure stuff. So you might recall from lesson one that both Leonard Euler's and our definition of mathematics, Shorman Math's definition, emphasizes measurement. We define it as the language of science. Mathematics is the language of science and a God-given tool for measuring and classifying pattern and shape. The measurement of things, it's where the ideas of mathematics, they connect to the physical world that God created. And instruments, those are the tools we use to measure with. So throughout history, one of the biggest problems for societies to overcome was deceptive practices through the use of changing standards of measure, using inaccurate instruments or combination of both of those. So people being deliberately deceptive or just not knowing enough about making an instrument that was accurate, so inaccuracy. Verses like Proverbs 20:23 20, they let us know that God considers such deceptive practices as great sins. And in his book, Measuring America, Andre Linkletter explained the problem like this. He said that the commonest deceit was simply to use two sets of weights and containers, the large one for buying and the small one for selling. And throughout history, both sacred and secular authorities have thundered against this practice. Another scripture is Deuteronomy 23, 13 through 16. That also describes this problem, but it also provides a solution. And in that it says that a full and fair weight you shall have, a full and fair measure you shall have, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So what's the solution? Well, it's to have a standard. That's what it means by full and fair that everybody else uses. It's a standard of weight and measure that everything else is compared to. And so both must be calibrated and or improved upon on a regular basis, such as the IPK, the international prototype of the kilogram that was discussed in the definition. So that is an attempt to make a full and fair weight. And then to measure how accurate it is, you have to have an instrument to do that. And so having super accurate instruments to measure things is important as well. Now, well, standards of weight like the IPK, they're developed by human hands. But the reason they're developed is because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do because God's Word says it is. If we reject His Word as a standard of truth, then we really have no reason to have accurate weights and measures. Throughout history, nations have sought to develop standard weights and measures specifically because God's Word was their standard for truth. So we have standards for weights and measures, which are how do we truly measure God's creation. And we have standards for how we're supposed to live that we find in Scripture that are true as well. And Charlemagne in 813 AD, his proclamation was that weights and measures be equal and just everywhere. George Washington, who we described earlier, his address to the U.S. Congress in 1791 stated that a uniformity in the weights and measures of the country is among the important measures submitted to you by the Constitution. 
So having unwavering standards is one way nations, states, individuals can express their love of God and of one another, caring for one another by not cheating each other, avoiding deception and corruption. So having standards of measure that everyone can agree on, that does matter. Let's move on to part B on unit conversions and think about weights and measures standards some more. It's something all nations should have as a priority, but it doesn't mean all nations need to use the same measurement standards. Performing unit conversions, that allows us to convert between units of different measurement standards or within a set of standards. So like converting from one monetary unit like US dollars to Mexican pesos for example. So you have a lot of equivalent measures that are listed in the lesson 16 rules and those can be used as unit multipliers. They're also known as conversion factors and we use those to convert from one unit to another. So we can write them as fractions. So for example there are four quarts per gallon, or four quarts in one gallon. We can also write that as one gallon over four quarts if we needed to. So we think of those as fractions and they're equal to one, right? Both of these are equal to one because four quarts is the same thing as one gallon. We have the same thing over the same thing. That ratio equals one. That's important to remember too. So converting between units, that requires multiplying by the appropriate conversion factor or factor. Sometimes we have to multiply by two or three or more conversion factors. Canceling units that appear in the numerator and denominator. And this method, it can be used to perform any unit conversion. So let's practice. Let's convert the following. A, convert three gallons to quarts. So any conversion, we can write down what's given first. So A, we were given three gallons. And we'll just do gal for short there. And then we want to convert that to quarts. So you can look at your rules from lesson 16. You might want to open up your reading assignment so you can go back and look at that to help you with this. And we would say that there are four quarts in one gallon. We'd write that equivalent measure as a ratio there, four quarts over one gallon. We don't want to write it one gallon over four quarts because the gallons wouldn't cancel and that's important. We write it four quarts over one gallon so the gallons cancel and we're left with quarts for units. And so we think about the number part and the unit parts separate on these and so now we just multiply the numbers together. Three times four is twelve over one gallon, we just leave it as 12 because 12 over 1 is equal to 12, right? And put the units down, quarts, 12 quarts. And we're supposed to round the answers to two decimal places, but this it has whole number, so we'll just leave it as 12 quarts and not write 12.00. So if we get a decimal problem, we'll do that as two decimal places. So B, 200 ounces to gallons. So again, write down what's given any unit multiplier problem. We can always write down what's given first. I'll write uh, the abbreviated form of ounces, OZ. And then we want to convert that to gallons. So looking at the equivalent measures we've been given, we could we know that in one cup there's eight ounces. We know that there's four cups in a quart and four quarts in a gallon. So we could use three unit multipliers here. So one cup over eight ounces. And if you're ever unsure of how to start one of these, just try to find the equivalent measure that will allow you to cancel out the ounces, cancel it out first, and these are designed so that you can look at your table of equivalent measures here in lesson 16 and you should be able to find the right unit multipliers from that. So you do this part and you cancel the ounces and then you're like, okay, I need to get from cups to gallons, but what what do I know from my table? Well, I know that there is 
one quart equals four cups, so I can say one quart QT over four cups. And then I can say that one gallon has four quarts, so one gallon over four quarts. And you should do, just like I'm doing here, cancel those units out so that you know that you did this right and you end up with gallons in the numerator at the very end and that tells you that you have the units right. So now do the numbers 200 times 1 times 1 times 1 is just 200 over 8 times 4 times 4 that's like 8 times 16 is 128 so we have 200 over 128, which you can do on your calculator, and that would round to 1.56 gallons. C, we want to convert 50 cubic centimeters to liters, so we write down what's given first, 50 cubic centimeters. So looking at our equivalent measures there's one milliliter in a cubic centimeter and a thousand milliliters in a liter so we could use two unit multipliers here so this is just a one-to-one -one conversion we call it one milliliter is the same thing as one cubic centimeter so we can go from units of length, length cubed, to units of capacity. That's what volume is, milliliters, liters, things like that. So now we need to go to liters, milliliters to liters. So one liter has 1,000 milliliters. So we can cancel those units out, milliliters, cubic centimeters. We're left with liters. And so we have 50 times 1 times 1 is 50. Over 1 times 1,000 is 1,000. 50 over 1,000 is 0 0.05 liters. So think carefully on these. Just if you're not sure where to go with something, just find the, the very first thing that you can that's an equivalent measure. So if you write down what's given first, you always do that and then look at your table of equivalent measures and hopefully you notice there it said one cubic centimeter equaled one milliliter so you can at least write that down and that's this first unit multiplier here and cross out your cubic centimeters and then you'll probably realize oh well a milliliter a thousand of those is a liter that's my other unit multiplier and write that down you don't have to know ahead of time that you need two unit multipliers. Just start with one, cancel those units, and then add the next one on when you find it. After a while, after you practice these for a while, you'll, you'll start memorizing those equivalent measures, and maybe you already have them memorized. That'd be great. Then it's easier to know how many you need to use and where to put them. Let's do another one convert the following and some of these are going to have English to metric conversions or vice versa in them sometimes called the US customary system to US customary and English system use a lot of the same units so in A we have the English measurement of cups we want to convert that to the metric measurement of liters eight cups to liters so we write down what's given that never changes write down what's given first then we're going to convert. So one cup or one quart per four cups. And then from there, you do the English to metric conversion one liter over 1.057 quarts. So that one we had to convert from cups to quarts, not cups to ounces or to gallons or anything like that. We did from cups to quarts because we also have the English to metric conversion given to us in the table of one liter over 1.057 quarts. So our quarts cancel, our cups cancel, we're left with liters. And so that will be 8 over 4 times 1.057.
and 8 over 4 is 2, right? So that's just 2 over 1.057. That's equal to 1.892. If you do that on your calculator, 1.89 liters. B, 850 milliliters to gallons. So write down what's given first. And we have capacity again, volume, and so we know somewhere to get from metric, the milliliters, to English, which is the gallons, we have to go through the liters to quarts conversion. So let's convert to liters, then we'll convert to quarts, then we can convert to gallons because there's four quarts in a gallon. So we'll say 1,000 milliliters in a liter, so one liter over. 1,000 milliliters, so our milliliters cancel, and then we we'll do our liter to quart conversion, but this time we need the quarts on top, 1.057 quarts over one liter, and our liters will cancel, and then quarts to gallons, one gallon has four quarts. So cancel our units just to make sure we did everything right. Quart over quart, liter over liter, milliliter over milliliter. And so we'll be left with 850 times 1.057. We ignore all the ones in there because we don't need those. 1,000 times 4, we could just do that, write that out as 4,000. And then you just get your calculator out, do 850 times 1.057 divided by 4,000, and rounded to two decimal places, you should be able to get 0 0.22 gallons. Don't forget your units. Don't just write the number down on these. You need the units also. This is a conversion of units. 0.22 gallons is the same thing as 850 milliliters. They just look different because the units make them different, right? If I went and measured out 0.22 gallons of water, that's going to be about the same. Within rounding differences, it'll be about the same as pouring out 850 milliliters of water. C, we're introducing a new angle measure here, 50 degrees, convert that to radians. There's, just like there's different ways of measuring capacity, milliliters, quarts, liters, gallons. We have different units for capacity. There's different units for measuring angles as well. Degrees and radians are the two main kinds that we use. So here we need the conversion factor of radians to degrees. It's pi radians over 180 degrees. So our degrees units cancel then. Normally we use 3.14 for pi, we round that. So we'll say 50 times 3.14 over 180. And then rounding that to two decimal places, get your calculator out and just calculate that out. You should get 0 0.87 radians. We'll do more with radians when we study trigonometry starting in lesson 18, but for now just know about that new conversion and the, the two different types of angle measure units, degrees and radians. Look at example three, convert dollars to rupees in A. So now we're doing money exchanges and instead of conversions a lot of times we think of these as exchanges and we think of the conversion factor as an exchange rate so because it is a ratio right and your table has 2015 exchange rates for the year 2015 and what one United States dollar or one USD is equal to compared to some different currencies in different countries so exchange rate, same thing as conversion factor, write down what's given first, 100, and we'll say USD for US dollars, and converting that to rupees, from our table we see that there's 63.6, I'll do a little r for rupees, that's equal to one US dollar. So the dollar units cancel there, so we'll mark those out 
because they're going to cancel their factor. So it's USD over USD. And we would just do 100 times 63.6. So that's going to be 6360, 6360 rupees. So that's our answer there, 6,360 rupees. In B, you need to think about this a little bit more, 300 rubles to euros. Well, let's write down what's been given, 300 and we'll say RUB, short for rubles. We don't have an exchange rate in our table of rubles to euros, but that's okay. We can go from rubles to U.S. dollars and then U.S. dollars to euros. So we just need to use two conversion factors here. And so when you see a problem like this, don't panic and think you can't do it because you don't have a rubles to euros conversion factor. No, just use two of the conversion factors from the table. So one U.S. dollar over 54.9 we're not doing rupees we're doing rubles here so be careful about that and then 0 0.89 euros EU short for euros over 1 US dollar cancel USDs cancel rubles and we see that we're left with euros that's what we were hoping for that would happen and so we have 300 times 0.89 over 54.9 and so that's equal to rounded to two decimal places 4.86 euros Now let's do some temperature conversions, and these require formulas. They don't really require conversion factors. So in A, converting 30 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit, we just need our formula, F for Fahrenheit equals 1.8 Celsius plus 32. So if we have 30 degrees Celsius, it's just like a evaluate type problem or a function. We could think of it even 1.8 times 30. We replace C with 30 plus 32. And so that's 54 plus 32. That equals 86 and that's just a whole number. We could say 86.0, but we'll leave it as a whole number, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So 30 degrees Celsius is the same thing as 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And then in B, we want to do 75 Fahrenheit to Kelvin, and Kelvins are just Celsius plus 273 degrees. So we need to get Fahrenheit to Celsius first. Then we'll add 273 to that to get Kelvins. So let's use our Fahrenheit to Celsius formula. F is 75, so we'll just go ahead and write that down. We have the formula already shown there in A. F is 75 is equal to 1.8 C plus 32. Solve this for C, then we add 273 to C to get Kelvin. And so subtract 32 from both sides, we'd have 1.8 C, I'm just moving that over to the left, is equal to 75 minus 32 is 43. Divide both sides by 1.8, we get C is equal to about 23.9. And then Kelvin is just C plus 273. Celsius, whatever that is, plus 273. So here we'd say 23.9 plus 273. And so that's going to be equal to 296.9 K for Kelvin. There's a lot of other conversions that we can do too, like length, area, volume. We're going to do some of those in Lesson 17. But well, that's all for unit conversions for now. 
Let's go on to part C on scientific notation. And working with scientific notation, that's one of the several methods of making it easier to work with really large and really small numbers. And we'll review converting to and from scientific notation first. And then we'll evaluate some scientific formulas using numbers written in scientific notation form. So look at example 16.5, convert these to scientific notation, round to two decimal places when you're done. So in A, let's just draw right on that and pretend like there's a decimal point right there, which is normally where it would be if you had a decimal, and then we'll move to the left, one, two, three, four, five. We move that decimal point to the left of the first non-zero digit. And so for A, we'll write 5.60 times 10 to the, how many places did we move over? We moved over five places to the left. So if we move to the left, we add positive values to the base 10 exponent. So we move to the left five, we say 10 to the fifth. 10 to the fifth is 100,000, right? So we're, we're saying 5.6 times 100,000. Now, is it really any faster to write 5.60 times 10 to the fifth than it is just to go 560,000? Well, no, it's really not faster to do that. So remember, scientific notation is to work with really large. I mean, like larger than 5.60 times 10 to the fifth. And really small numbers. So what we're doing here is just getting practice and hopefully for you reviewing how to convert something to scientific notation. So these aren't like the best examples for what scientific notation is for. It's a lot bigger numbers and a lot smaller numbers than this. So B, 852.34. Again, put your pencil at the decimal point. Move to the left. One, two, and so we'll have 8.5234. Now we're supposed to round to two decimal places here, so we'll just say 8.52. That's what that would round to. Times, how many places did we move? We moved two, so times 10 to the second. C, move to the right of the first non-zero digit. So put your pencil or pen at the decimal point again, and preferably you should be using a pencil as you do your homework, but move to the right one, two, three, four, five. So we move to the right this time, and so that means we add negative numbers to the base 10 exponent, but we'd say 7.119, and we want to round that to two decimal places. So we'll say 7.119, that'd be 7.12 times 10 to the minus 5. 7.12 times 10 to the minus 5. In example 6, let's go the other way, convert from scientific notation to standard form. So in A, the best thing to do is just write down the decimal part of that 6.125, and then we have times 10 to the 6. So that means we move the decimal place back over to the right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we fill in those blank areas with placeholder zeros. So we end up with 6, 1, 2, 5, 0, 0, 0 and put our commas in the right places so we'd have 6,125,000. In B, write down 85.4 and we're going to move it over a little bit because it's to the negative times 10 to the negative fifth so I know we're going to be moving that decimal to the left. So this is a really small number so we would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and replace the decimal point there. We, we've moved it over. We have placeholder zeros that are going to need to go in there. So we get 0 0.000854. So that's the standard form for that. 
Now in example 7 we'll use some scientific formulas to practice using scientific notation in a problem. And this says that Ohm's law relates electrical voltage V and resistance R and current in a circuit and is described by that formula V equals I times R. So when we see something like IR that means I times R in a formula. It doesn't mean I plus or I minus. It means I times. We're multiplying those two together. So we want to calculate the voltage when the current is 2.1 times 10 to the minus 3 amps. The resistance is 5.9 times 10 to the minus 2 ohms. Write the answer in scientific notation form, rounded to two decimal places. So let's just think about this. Let's just write this down. We have V equals I R and then V is equal to we've been given I just focus on the numbers you don't need to worry about the units 2.1 times 10 to the minus 3 and then times 5.9 times 10 to the minus 2 so in scientific notation you know, when you see this part this times 10 to the part it really does mean multiply and so we really are doing 2.1 times 10 to the minus third and which means that order doesn't matter when you have factors right so we can rearrange this we could say 2.1 times 5.9 times 10 to the minus third times 10 to the minus 2. We get the base tens together over there and similar bases we know we multiply those together we just add the exponents. 2.1 times 5.9 that's equal to 12.39 and then 10 to the third times 10 to the minus 2 that's 10 to the minus fifth. So now we have times 10 to the minus fifth. Now we don't leave scientific notation like that. The standard form is to have the decimal to the right of the first non-zero digit. So we need to move that to the left one, which means we need to add plus one up here. If we moved it to the left one, we add plus one. So we end up with 1.239 or 1.24 rounded to two decimal places. 1.24 times 10 to the minus four. We rounded to two decimal places because that's what the problem asked us to do. So we get 1.24 times 10 to the minus 4 and we could have a capital V on there for volts as well. Now doing a problem like this on your calculator, different calculators are set up different ways for doing scientific notation. like. This one on a Macintosh computer, do you see that EE button? That basically means times 10 to the. So for example on this, you could type in 2.1 and then hit EE. That means times 10 to the and then you would say minus 3. Then you do times and do the other number 5.9. EE which means times 10 to the and then plus or minus sign to make it negative exponent 2. So 5.9 E to the negative 2 the calculator knows that means 5.9 times 10 to the minus 2. So we hit equals and we get that number that's not in scientific notation form it's in standard form but you should be able to write that in scientific notation form. On some calculators you may look for a 10 to the X button instead of an EE button. On graphing calculators like a TI-83 or TI-84 you're going to have to hit the yellow second button at the top left and then look for a key that has a yellow capital E capital E that's above the key and that's the one that you'll press. You press second and then that EE to to make it do the times 10 to the part. So if it doesn't have that and it just has a 10 to the X button, a lot of times what you do is you'll type in the number part, like the 2.1 part, then you'll hit the times button on the calculator, then you'll hit the 10 to the X button on the calculator, then you type in the value of the exponent, so for 2.1 times 10 to the minus 3 you'd be typing in negative 3, then 
you'll hit enter. So your calculator it should have a user's manual that goes with it that you can use to figure out how to type in the scientific notation form. Let's do one more example 8 here, pH. That's a measure of how acidic or how basic a solution is. And if you've had chemistry or you're doing chemistry, you know like acidic things are like tangy tasting and basic things are, are kind of like soapy, kind of bitter. If pH, it's calculated using this formula here, minus log H plus, where H plus refers to the acid concentration, the hydronium ion, if you want to be real specific. So for the formula to work properly, the concentration must be measured in units of molarity, moles per liter, that's a chemistry unit, and use the formula pH equals minus log H plus to find the pH of a solution where H plus is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 6. So in A, what we do is on the calculator, type in minus log of 1.2 times 10 to the minus 6. So on this calculator, this computer calculator on a Macintosh computer, we would type in 1.2 EE plus or minus to make a minus exponent 6. Then we'd hit the log button and we get minus 5.92 and so we'd say that's equal to minus negative 5.92. We're supposed to round to one decimal place so that'd be a positive 5.9. So the pH is 5.9. That's a lot easier way to describe than saying well the hydronium ion concentration is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 6 molar it's easier just to say the pH is 5.9 neutral pH is 7 so it's not acidic or basic so that's one reason we use pH in chemistry is to make it easier to record to talk about acidic and basic concentrations so in B, you're going to do the same thing, minus log of 4.5 times 10 to the minus 9. So get the calculator out again and clear it. And on this one, we have 4.5 EE minus 9. And then we hit the log base 10, not natural log, but log base 10. And we get minus 8.347. And so that's going to be minus, minus 8.347. And so rounding that to one decimal place, we get positive 8.3. And again, it's easier to say the pH is 8.3 than to say the hydronium ion concentration is 4.5 times 10 to the minus 9 molar. On a graphing calculator, a lot of times what you'll be doing is you'll be hitting the log button first and it'll do like log it'll show up on the screen and then there'll be a open parentheses there and so then you'll just do 4.5 hit your EE button to the negative 9 and on a graphing calculator you want to don't hit the subtraction symbol usually down at the bottom on a on a Texas Instruments graphing calculator anyways you'll see a symbol down at the bottom right that has little parentheses and a minus sign that's what you use to do a negative nine you don't use the subtraction symbol that's between the times and the plus button you use the little negative in parentheses and then you close parentheses on your problem and you should get negative 8.347 and then you just do minus or opposite of that which is positive 8.3 okay moving on to part D arc lengths and sectors so we're kinda of switching gears here now we're thinking about circles and arcs those are nothing more than fractions of circles either a fraction of the circumference or a fraction of the area that's what a sector is a fraction of a circumference is an arc so we have we can measure arcs using angles but we can also measure the fraction of the circumference that that takes up as well and get a a length measurement 
as well. So remembering that there's 360 degrees of arc in a circle, that's what you learned in lesson 11, it follows that half a circle has 180 degrees, a fourth of a circle has 90 degrees, and so on. So look at example A in this example problem here. Given a circle with a radius of 14 meters, A, find the length of a 145 degree arc. Well, 145 degrees of arc, what fraction of the circumference is that? Well, if there's 360 degrees in a circle, it's 145 over 360. That's the fraction of a circle that that equals. So what we need to do is just take that and multiply it by the circumference, 2 times pi times radius. So we just multiply by 2 times pi, which is 3.14, times the radius that they gave us here, that's 14. So we can multiply out 145 over 360, leave that fraction, and then the circumference of a whole circle is 2 times pi times radius, which would just be 87.92. And so then we're multiplying it by that fraction of a circle, that 145 over 360. And so if you do that on your calculator, you should get 35.41 meters. So that's how long that arc would be. On a circle that has a radius of 14 meters, a 145 degree arc is 35.41 meters long. So moving on to B, we want to do the area this time. And so this is the area of a 50 degree sector. So we could think of this like a piece of pie or a slice of pizza or something. So, I mean, just think about cutting a pizza into quarters. That'd be 90 degree pieces, right? So 50 degrees would maybe be something like that. So just to get an idea, that's shaded area right there. That's an estimate of this sector that we're going to figure out. So the whole circle, that would be pi r squared. The sector would be 50 over 360. And we could just say 5 over 36, right? We could just simplify that down. 5 over 36 times pi times the radius is 14 squared. So again, using 3.14 for pi, we can say that would equal 5 over 36. And just do 3.14 times 14 times 14. Make sure you do that 14 squared. You should get 615.44. So that's the area of the whole circle. Multiply that by 536. That's the area of a 50 degree sector, a 50 degree slice, basically, of that whole circle. And so that would equal 85.48. And we did length times length. This is area, so make sure you say meters squared for the units there. Okay, well, that's all for lesson 16.